The Holy Spirit chose Paul and Barnabas as missionaries, and they went to the uh, mission field. They were sent to the mission field to be with that. Uh, they boarded ship at Seleucia. If you, if you can see the a map on the screen, uh, it's a port, Seleucia, and they went to this island called Cyprus. It's, it's an island in the Mediterranean Sea. It's about 50 miles wild and 110 miles long, and so it's pretty big. Uh, it's a big island. And they arrived in, in Salamis uh, first, the east coast of the Cyprus. Uh, there were a number of Jewish synagogues, uh, meaning that there were a lot of people, a lot of Jewish people were living in there. So Paul and Barnabas, they visited a synagogue, Jewish synagogues, and preached the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Jews. So it's not much, you know, they were sent as Gentile, like missionary for Gentiles, but to be exact, the very first uh, the targets were the Jewish people, and, and Salamis. I think they had a great time in Salamis. Uh, it doesn't say how effective the mission was. It doesn't say how many people got saved, but it doesn't say they got rejected either. So I guess they had a great time there. You know, Barnabas' uh, hometown is uh, Cyprus, so they probably meeting a lot of you know uh, family members. They had a great time together. After they preached in Jewish synagogue in Salamis, the next destination was they went all the way to the west side of the island called uh, Paphos. And in Korean, it is, they say Pavo. Actually, they say Pavo, right? So it's really easy to um, uh, memorize. But in English, it's Paphos. And they met two, two men in, in, in this area in Paphos. One was Sergius Paulus, and the other one was Bar Jesus. And Sergius Paulus was proconsul of the island, and he was like a governor of Cyprus. And he was appointed by a Roman Empire and governing the island. And thankfully, Sergius Paulus, the high official, called for Paul and Barnabas because he wanted to hear the word of God. He was intelligent, and he was a very open-hearted man, and he had a desire to listen to the Word of God. So far, so good. Everything was smooth. Everyone seemed to be welcoming. Even the governor wanted to hear about the Word of God. So it's all good. It was a good start. And they must be thinking, you know, this, this whole mission journey, mission thing is it's working out. People are nice. They're welcoming us. This is going great. But first eight, they start to have a problem. And it caused by this guy named Bar Jesus, the Jewish sorcerer. And he was assisting uh, Sergius Paulus as counselor or advisor. And he was very close to uh, the governor. And this guy, Bar Jesus, opposed Paul and Barnabas. And he didn't want the governor hearing the uh, gospel message. So he told the governor not to listen to Paul and Barnabas. And it was a problem for Paul and Barnabas. Well, let's look at verse 9 and 10. Let's read it together. 3, 2, 1. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Alamis and said, You are a child of devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will it never stop pervading the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. You know, Barnabas, Barnabas, uh, he was quiet. He didn't say anything. But look at Paul, like, oh my goodness, this is harsh. But what is wrong with Paul? And Paul is extremely angry. He's confronting Alamis, the bar of Jesus, looking straight in his eyes, calling him a child of devil, enemy of everything that is right. He curses him. You're going to be blind for a time. He punishes him. Not even able to see the light of the sun. If you close your eyes, you feel, you can sense the light of the sun, the light. 
You can, you can see that light. You can sense it. It's a complete blindness. You'll be cursed. I'm condemning you. How could he say such things? How rude he was. Isn't he supposed to go and help out heal people and encourage them? You're good. You're, I love you. And Jesus loves you. He's not doing that. Well, bar Jesus. Let's look at him. Well, what was his problem? He doesn't like those bar, a Barnabas and Paul to preach the gospel to the governor. And that was it. You know, like those Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, they had the same problems. But they didn't curse them. They didn't call them you know, names of a child of the devil. You know, like, you know, go, go, you know, you're going to get blinded. And they don't do that. But why for this, this guy, Bar Jesus? And Bar Jesus didn't do anything to deserve a, such a cruel treatment from Paul. And obviously, you know, he's just looking at the passage. He is overreacting, right? He is just out of control. You know, maybe he has this temper problem. I don't know what it was. You know, Bible is, is clearly says that we should be very careful expressing our anger. In James 1.19, the famous one, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Paul is like a machine gun. He quickly releases. He's not even listening from him. He doesn't give him a chance at all. He's just quickly releasing his anger and frustration in full speed. What's wrong with that? I mean, what would you do if you were in that kind of situation? You're in a mission trip in Montreal, Haiti, Native Reserve, Dominican Republic. You're trying to evangelize. You are trying to plant the seed of gospel. And someone doesn't like to share the gospel message in that area. So they oppose you. They give you a hard time inter interfering, interrupting you. Would you be mad? Would you be upset? Well, yes, sort of, right? But would you be upset like this? Like Paul? He's furious. You know, how you upset, but this is not the end of the world. You know, I was in uh, many missions. Uh, I remember this particular mission trip that I went to, one of the very first mission trips. I went to Central Asia, Kazakhstan. Um, and we went to this remote village. Uh, we went to the school, and we asked people to come, and we did our skates, dance, you know, taekwondo demonstration. Uh, we had quite a lot of students came, and. We, we played the GS movie. That was the plan. That was a strategy. And then after watching this movie called Jesus, Jesus movie, and we preached the gospel, and people accept the, uh, uh, the gospel, like Jesus Christ. And that, is, that was our plan. Everything was going great. But suddenly, all of a sudden, there's an old lady came and started yelling, you know, and everybody's just scared. We had to leave. We were kicked out. But we brought this watermelon because they had a drought at the time. And we brought a lot of watermelons and, and, and waters uh, as a gift. So we, as, when, when we were leaving, we just, you know, we gave to them. We hand them over. Please have them. This is our gifts. And this old lady brought, like, a couple more ladies. Uh, and, and they were, like, just, like, you know, throwing that watermelon and then just like smashing it around. Do you remember that, Jason? You were there, right? Do you remember that? Right. And we were like, oh my goodness, what should we do? And I was, I was quite angry, but what can I do? Right? Like, so we, were, we were just like sitting down and, and uh, I was looking at the watermelon. And I, was, I, was, I was thirsty, so I was like, you know, <laughs> pick a piece of watermelon and start eating it. That's all I did. I, I didn't do anything. Um, you know. Um, I was in that kind of situation. I was opposed. We were 
opposed, and, and, and the, the evangelism failed because of the late night, that was upsetting uh, moment. But I had to move on. When we do uh, the mission training, we encourage people uh, to lead those people along. Like we might encounter those kind of people. Just in case, if you see those people, if they are giving you a hard time, if they are kicking you out, it don't be, you know, don't go against them. Uh, but just like leave them alone or leave. Leave the scene. That's, you know, that's, that's pretty biblical. That's how Jesus taught to disciples. Matthew chapter 10, 14, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your word, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. If they're not welcoming you or they're not listening to you, just leave them alone. It's not your responsibility. We don't have to argue. We don't have to fight with them. There's no need to get upset. No need to hurt. Their, I don't think we don't have to hurt their feelings either. To shake off the dust and leave. But look at Paul. Isn't it weird? Reading this passage, it just doesn't make sense. It's blew out of proportion. A calling, you are a child of devil. You are going to be blind. You are not even able to see the light of the sun. You are causing all kinds of problems. You are evil. And what kind of missionary is he? Paul is the one who's causing trouble at this moment. Don't you think? He is terrible. He's a rookie missionary, so he's making a mistake. Right? But look at verse 11. This is even stranger. Verse 11 says, okay, let's read it together. 3, 2, 1. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him. And he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. What happened? How can we understand this text? Paul cursed him and Holy Spirit approved it. Bar Jesus became blind for a while. He's just going blind and seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And what is going on? And how can we apply? How can we inter like, you know, uh, interpret this passage? All right, well, Bible says that Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. If he was filled with the Holy Spirit, that means he was doing the right thing. Amen? He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Supposed to be doing the right thing. If he was filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible clearly says that. Even the anger and all the frustration he had, even the curse he made, they should be considered as work of the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit means to be under the Spirit's control. It means that he was not acting in self-will. It's not Paul talking. It's not him condemning our Jesus. It was the Holy Spirit talking through Paul and Paul was simply following Spirit's guidance. That's what he was doing. So he did what the Holy Spirit told him to do. So it was the right thing to do. Godly thing to do. He listened and obeyed. It looks ugly, but it was the right thing to do for him. All right. Let's look at the bar Jesus. His name means Son of Jesus. What a name for sorcerer. Son of Salvation in Aramaic. At the time of Jesus, at the time of the early church, you know, the name Jesus, you know, it was a common name among Jewish people. I don't think he took the name with a reference to Jesus Christ our Lord. He was a sorcerer. What do you know about sorcerer? The word sorcerer comes from the Greek word magus, from which we get magic. The sorcerer, they are magicians. The word initially doesn't have a mean to anything bad, anything evil itself. In Matthew chapter 2, there are wise men from the east. They call magi. 
So they were called megas in Greek, the same word. The wise men were the astronomers from Persia, and megas could be translated as astronomers or scientists. But Bar Jesus, this guy was not an astronomer. He was not a scientist. Then who was he? Is he just a magician pulling a rabbit out of, out of hat? No, he is something else. We need to see this very clearly in order for us to understand this whole text. You know, Paul calls him, and you know, there's a little fishy about this guy, Bar Jesus. He calls him, You are the child of devil. You know, Paul knew something about this guy. Holy Spirit told him, and he detected who he was about. He was sorcerer, and his wisdom came from devil. He was under the influence of the spirit of devil. So we see the contrast. Paul was under the control of the Holy Spirit. Our Jesus, he was under the control of Satan. Paul was a representative of kingdom of God. And Bar Jesus, he was a representative of kingdom of devil, kingdom of Satan. See what's going on here, right? It was battle. It was a war. This crash between the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of Satan. That's what's going on. They're crashing together. Not so much physical, but spiritual battle. Therefore, it was not about Paul's emotional breakdown. It was not about his temper issue. But it was a battle, spiritual warfare. Do you get that? You know, people enter the Christian life with many expectations. You've been told if you believe in Jesus Christ, your sin will be forgiven. You will be saved. No more condemnation. You become children of God and you go to heaven. You probably heard, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, your Christian life will be amazing. Abundant life eternal life, abundant joy and peace and love, which are great, which are so true, we experience that. God grant us this wonderful blessings through Jesus Christ, and we experience that. It's all great. But at the same time, we have to know, we have to realize the Christian life is also about having a battle. The battle began once you believe in Jesus Christ. Before accepting Jesus Christ, you are sort of property of Satan. You don't need battle for that. You are already defeated. You're helpless. You're under the control of Satan. But once you believe in Jesus Christ, you're no longer the property of Satan but you are belonging to Jesus Christ. By the blood of Jesus Christ, you are belonging to the kingdom of God. Amen. But our faith journey is not easy. We are living a life of mortal combat. This ongoing war against the enemy, Satan, and his army, they're constantly attacking us. Now, Satan is real. Amen? Do you believe that? Some people think this is too superstitious and too, too primitive thing to talk about in, in modern day church. But Satan is so real. God is real. Angel is real. Holy Spirit is real. So is Satan. And Satan is real. And you know what? He's powerful. And he's smart. And he's crafty. And he's working hard. You know what? When we are doing ministry, as we are engaging deeper into our ministry, as we're getting deeper uh, relationship with Christ, getting closer to Christ, as we are serving this church of God more and more, getting deeper and deeper, the intensity of temptation becomes stronger. 
The intensity of interruption becomes stronger. The intensity of battle becomes stronger. The enemy wants to oppose us even stronger. When we do the work of God, His ministry, one thing that we have to know for sure, we should expect, I mean, prepared, be prepared for this opposition, satanic opposition and satanic attack. You know, I guarantee you, as you are doing the work of God, as you want to serve the kingdom of God more and more, I guarantee someone or the situation will give you a hard time. Some of you probably experienced it. You want to have a right relationship with Jesus Christ and you are trying so hard, but even though you are trying so hard, as you are going you know, harder and harder, you know, it's, 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 it's not working right. I guarantee you, someone will discourage you. Someone will try to break you. Just like Bar Jesus did to Paul and Barnabas. And you know what? Those are normal things. And that is part of Christian life. That is our faith journey. It's a battle. The battle already begun. Even now, Satan is attacking us right now, even right now, and distracting us, interrupting us. And Satan will not be quiet. Satan hates us doing this evangelism, leading someone to Christ. You know, Satan will do anything and everything possible to keep the person in his kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. You guys are familiar with this story, Devin Patrick Kelly, the shooting incident in Texas. He carried out the deadly mass shooting in Texas on last Sunday while they're worshiping God. In the middle of worship, he showed up and killed, he shoot, he opened up the fire, killing 25 people and, unborn, and one unborn child at this church, the First Baptist Church in Texas. Tragedy. He killed. The shooter, uh, his ex-wife, one of his ex-wives, I think he had two or three, I interviewed with CBS yesterday, and I was watching that. And she described Kelly as menacing and abusive man who constantly, constantly threatened her and her family with death. And look at the title. And she also said this. Demons and hatred cons consumed him. Isn't it? I, it? It's just like goosebump. The tragedy happened. And somehow, something is behind of this guy. He was under the influence. Was he just crazy? Was it just a mental illness thing? Was it like a psychological thing? He was abused when he was a little, like, like child, like child abuse experience? I don't know. I don't know what happened to this guy. But one thing that we must know, really sadly, whenever those things happen, is Satan is one of the primary agents influencing them. Just like what his ex-wife said. He was consumed by demon and hatred. Sometimes we hear this breaking news, story of violence, story of murder and rapes, and we wonder, we question ourselves, we're living in a sick world. How could those people possibly have done such a hideous crimes? This is, this is tragedy. 
And we have to realize someone's behind of that scene, behind of the curtain. Satan. First Peter chapter five verse eight to nine says this: Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour, devour, consume. He wants to eat and consume us, and constantly looking around and, and try to find that one individual to devour. Satan, that's his characteristic. He wants to devour. He wants to eat us, consume us. And we become under his influence, under his control. We become sort of his avatar. We must know there is spiritual battle. We must prepare for it. I'm not going did with it today, but just a couple of things. How to fight this battle? Number one, be alert. We need to watch out. We have to know and be careful and be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Be sensitive to this warfare. Always saying, "Yeah, there must be something going on." And be sensitive. Be alert. Wake up. Don't just leave with, without any defense. You gotta, you gotta be alert. Always depend on the Holy Spirit. Be sensitive. Sober mind. We need to try have clear conscience as possible. Sober mind. Have a clean spirit, clean mind. Reading the Bible, meditating the Word of God, and and praying and worshiping Jesus, we can have this sober mind. No, those things are needed in order for us to fight back. It is necessary. The battle is real. There's a good news. You know what? We sang this song. Our God is stronger. Our God is wiser. Our God is. It's bigger. If you are with God, if you are with Christ, we are victorious. Amen. Because He already won the battle on the cross. Satan is already defeated two thousand years ago, and that is a great news. Amen. But we we trust that we once we know that Christ is defeated, it's it's game over. Gg. But until the day of second coming of Jesus Christ, the Satan will resist. That's the, not something that we have to know. He will fight us. He won't give up. He's not a quitter. He's constantly wrestling with us and and tempting us, attacking us. So brothers and sisters, we need to fight this battle together. So we're in the same team. We're in the same you know, this military team. Alliance. I hope and pray we are our church community. No spiritual thing. It's not just about you know, gathering together, having fun. It's also about the battle. We're fighting this, this fight together. So brother and sister, hope and pray. You know, we be alert, we be sober, and keep on fighting. Against this kingdom of sin. Thank you.